Welcome to the Tom Woods Show, episode 389. Climate change is our subject for today, but specifically carbon taxes as a public policy response to climate change. Our frequent guest and friend, Bob Murphy, has been involved in a back and forth with a libertarian slash conservative policy analyst named Jerry Taylor, who has tried to make a conservative case for a carbon tax, and Bob Murphy is not buying. So we're going to look at this whole debate, which is very important because if such a tax were to be imposed, well, the consequences would be not very good, to put it mildly. Bob Murphy, you all know as a frequent guest of this program, has a blog over at consultingbyrpm.com. He holds a Ph.D. in economics from New York University. He's the author of numerous books, including a free textbook in economics called Lessons for the Young Economist. He's also the author of two books in the Politically Incorrect Guide series, The Politically Incorrect Guide to Capitalism and The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Great Depression and the New Deal. Both of those books are available in audiobook format, and if you haven't already, you can get a free audiobook like that one via the offer available at TomWoodsAudio.com. Make sure and check out today's show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 389, not only because we link to every entry in this debate between Bob Murphy and Jerry Taylor, as well as a couple of other articles we're going to be talking about today, but also because we link to several of Bob's free books, including Lessons for the Young Economist. He's got several free books, and I mean absolutely free, no strings attached. So make sure and check those out at tomwoods.com slash 389. Here we go, my conversation with Bob Murphy. Bob, welcome back. Thanks for having me, Tom. Always a pleasure. We're going to talk about climate change, but more specifically, a carbon tax issue today, particularly because of this back and forth you've been having with Jerry Taylor of the Niskanen Center. And it's very, very interesting, the arguments that are made on both sides. It's I'm, I love following, I, maybe I'm an oddball, but I love following back and forth exchanges between people on the internet because it's uh, it's lively. It's more lively than it would be in the pages of a magazine where you have to wait three weeks in between installments. I don't really know where to start here. Uh, I'd, I'd kind of like to start, if you don't mind, with something that is not directly related to your exchange with him over the carbon tax, and that is an article that you sent me by Taylor called Libertarian Principles and Climate Change. Is it okay if we start there? Sure. What he's basically saying in this article is that, in fact, there's no reason that libertarians, in particular, should be opposed to government action against climate change. And and he goes through and tries to answer the various arguments that libertarians have made op- opposing government action on climate change. So he, he answers the claim that the science is not adequate to justify the kinds of approaches that are being proposed against climate risks. He says that... Uh, he it addresses the argument this will hurt the economy, it will produce fewer benefits than costs, it'll make government larger, uh, and so on and so forth. And he says, look, if you're a libertarian, it doesn't matter to it shouldn't matter to you whether protecting private property rights against aggressors creates or destroys jobs or produces fewer or more benefits. This, this is completely irrelevant to a libertarian. If there is a, pro- a property rights violation, if there's damage being done to people, that's the issue. And whether or not the science is adequate is, of course, not a libertarian issue per se at all. What was your overall response to that article? We'll link to it on the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 389. Well, sure. So that by itself, you know, the stuff you just said, I actually wouldn't have had much of a problem with. OK, so my my concern or the reason his, his post annoyed me is that it's in the context of he at the Niskanen Center in particular, is is leading, I mean, one of their main signature issues now. It's a relatively new um, D.C. think tank. I think they they uh, started in 2014. Is this uh, the same Jerry Taylor who used to be at the Cato Institute? Oh, yeah, same okay. guy. The same guy who used to be, you know, very against action against, you know, in the name of climate change, who would quote uh, Niskanen when he was the president of Cato to say, like, hey, look at these greens and how they're trying to, 
you know, hurt capitalism when the science really doesn't justify it. So, fine. And, and I used to quote Jerry Taylor. All right. Yeah. The same guy. OK. All right. So, I mean, so there you for, So for one thing, like I say, it doesn't mean his arguments are wrong. And of course, people are allowed to change their mind. But there's plenty of people I won't name names, but there are plenty of people who, uh, you know, Bruce Bartlett is the most obvious and uh, David Frum, like they they will flip their position on something and then write excoriating pieces just you know, challenging the the moral fiber of people who are espousing the things that they used to be the cheerleaders for five years ago. Yeah, without letting their readers know that, you know what I mean. So it's fine to change your mind, but you know, in a, the analogy, Tom, you and I, of course, are quite open about the fact that we used to be in favor of certain U.S. foreign policy, and that's why I don't. Uh, so anyway, okay, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah, no, yeah. It's a, it's a similar <laughs> situation. All right, all right. So okay. go ahead. So. Um, so it's true. So in that context, that's why it, his piece annoyed me is because he's using it as part of his overall steamroller attempt to get libertarians and conservatives to be open to the possibility of a, a U.S. federal government carbon tax, thinking that, oh, yeah, actually, this might not be such a bad idea. So him trying to sell that. So, like I said, the specific argument, yes, it is true. Some uh, libertarians have put all their eggs in one basket when it comes to the climate change debate. And saying, oh, yeah, this is just a hoax. You know, those those climate gate emails proved it. Al Gore is a big liar and this is crazy. And and that's kind of how they rested the case. I certainly haven't been doing that for years. I have been arguing on the point of, hey, let's stipulate the science, you know, the, the physical relationships, the physics and the chemistry and the, the projections about what would happen with emissions and so on. Does it follow that therefore you need states to use their power to go ahead and do X, Y, and Z. And I would argue that no, it doesn't. And so, uh, so that's the, that's the issue on this one particular thing where it's, yes, it is true that some of the arguments used by certain libertarians in the climate change debate really aren't great arguments, but they certainly don't justify what Jerry Taylor thinks ought to be done, namely having the U S government impose a carbon tax. All right. So, in other words, for so the, me, for the sake I, of I, argument, you're you're saying let's say let's say that the science on this, as that they say, is the mainstream science. Let's say that's correct. Let's even stipulate that for the sake of argument, and then show that these interventions being proposed are still a bad idea. Yeah, I mean, yeah, oh, exactly. Yeah. That's and that's totally been my story because again, I do a lot of work for the Institute for Energy Research on this topic, and just the way that climate works. Sir, as an economist, I certainly can't come out and say, you know, oh, I've I've l- looked at the debates between Richard Lindzen and these other guys, and in my opinion, Lindzen's right, and therefore the you know parameters of global warming. They would just say, well, you're an economist, you don't know what you're talking about. That wouldn't get any currency. What I have done is use the IPCC's own documents. I'll use the own the models that the Obama administration selects to calibrate the settings for global warming, and I'll just point out things. You know, and and so showing, look at on its own terms, this stuff doesn't follow. Like just to give you one example, it's very popular to pick a, a goal of limiting global warming to two degrees Celsius, and a lot of people say that's not enough. We should do one point five degrees Celsius as a ceiling. Using William Nordhaus's own model, that one point five C warming limit would cost humanity many trillions of dollars in net damages compared to doing nothing. Okay, and that that guy William Nordhaus, he's the guy who co-authored the book with Samuelson for some of the editions of that popular textbook, right? So this this is not some rabid free market ideologue. This is a huge interventionist who's a pioneer in this field, and yet you know their own models show that these goals that the environmentalists are grabbing that now just sort of become commonplace uh, cannot be justified using their own models. So so I'm I'm doing that within that framework. And just to give you another example, uh, Tom, of what Jerry Taylor's doing in this piece, he'll say things like, "Hey, if it's if something is a rights violation, you know, like if you, if you don't have the right to emit greenhouse gases and cause people in Bangladesh to suffer rising coast or you know water and so forth, water levels, ocean levels, well then don't give me some kind of utilitarian cost benefit analysis. How is that libertarian? And that's true. And Murray Rothbard wouldn't like that kind of argument. But Rothbard also hates the argument that says, oh, if there is this externality, let's assume that that makes sense, that therefore the solution is to have federal bureaucrats put a a tax on it and decide the optimal amount of the rights violations that maximizes social utility, which is what Taylor's response is, right? I mean, so if if you say, yeah, people are robbing banks, the solution certainly wouldn't be for the federal government to put a tax on robbing banks to get the optimal amount of bank robbery. 
but yet that's what Taylor's solution is. So again, he is right narrowly just looking at it that certain libertarians and their arguments uh, is not something that would come out of Murray Rothbard's mouth when it comes to pollution. But by the same token, the whole enterprise of what the Niskanen Center is trying to do on this topic also would be anathema to Murray Rothbard. So it's it's very disingenuous. Can you, for the layman, without uh, all the technical stuff, just go through the basic case that he's making for his particular proposal for a carbon tax? Because he's pitching it to conservatives in particular. Sure. So, again, from a 30,000-foot view, and I— I, I know you're good about putting links if people want to learn more detail, so let me just try to give people— Oh, yeah. A, every, uh, every article we're talking about, your whole back and forth with him will be mm-hmm. linked at tomwoods.com slash 389, so you can take that for granted. So the basic case here, and, and this isn't unique to Taylor. This, this is the standard for people who are trying to tell conservatives or libertarians, hey, guys, let's stop having this knee-jerk uh, aversion to environmental issues. Let's, let's think through this logically, and they'll say, look at— Standard textbook economics says that the, the market works well when costs and benefits are internalized and so that people are bearing the full brunt of the consequences of their activities and they're capturing all the benefits. right? But when things deviate from that, then you get problems. So if, if you're doing an activity that showers all kinds of benefits on others and you can't collect payment from them, then you're not going to do enough. And so there's a prima facie case for a subsidy. Right, which is why you know the government might subsidize education or whatever, because we want it helps people if everybody's educated beyond just the individual, and so people might not privately spend enough on education. Okay, or military defense or those standard stuff. On the other hand, if there are things that cause harms on others, and because of the existing institutional structure, they can't stop you and they can't demand payment from you, from you for those harms, then people engage in too much of that activity, and so there's a prima facie case for a tax. And this is following out of the, the tradition of A.C. Pagu, the economist. It's called a Pagovian tax, if people know that term. So there's that. And so Taylor and others will say, hey, look, at guys, we're not claiming to be scientists here, but it certainly looks like there's a general consensus that humanity is emitting too much greenhouse gases and it's going to cause problems, certainly down the road. And so in terms of free market principles, you're not allowed to just dump chemicals in the river. You know, you can't just say in the name of corporate progress more TVs and cars is good, even if it's dumping chemicals in the river that's hurting homeowners down the down the stream. And so by the same token, if it really is true that emitting you know, carbon dioxide and other things is is causing going to cause damages to people, well, we, we can't just ignore that. That's 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 not scientific. And that's certainly not conservative or libertarian. And then they say, hey, look, it, there's an, a benefit here. Even if you don't go along with that, you know, even if you're agnostic about the exact magnitude of those damages and so on, guess what? The U.S. tax code right now is so inefficient with taxes on labor and capital that if we imposed a big carbon tax, we could use that revenue not to fund new spending, but to cut those other tax rates and those other things. And so the slogan here is they say to tax bads, not goods, meaning tax something that you know is is an activity you want there to be less of, namely emissions of greenhouse gases and reduce the taxes on things you want there to be more of, namely work and saving and investment. And so that's, I, you know, that's the, and, the, and then they can point to studies trying to estimate those, those impacts and so on to say, well, what if we had a, a, a big carbon tax and, a, and all the revenue was used to lower the corporate income tax rate? Wow, look at that. You know, the economy might grow even in conventional terms, plus we'd get all the, the savings uh, in terms of avoided environmental damage. So it's a win-win. So that's, that's the, the general, um, position they'll give that they'll say look at even if you're not really sure about the global warming stuff if we at least you know why don't we strike a deal with people on the left and say we'll go along with a new carbon tax like you want but you can't use it to fund your green boondoggles instead use it to reduce taxes on like corporate income and so forth because in your view you know we're the, the fate of the humanity is at stake here and so clearly you know you, you don't hate capitalists that much right you'd be willing to go along with us and give a tax cut to capitalists if we agree to a carbon tax. So, so, so we'll so we'll tell the progressives, look, uh, yeah, we'll give you re- we'll get rid of the the tariffs in exchange for uh, the income tax. But we we got to get rid of the tariffs, and we'll give you your income tax. And therefore, from now on, we'll have only an income tax, and there'll never ever again be a tariff, which came back five years later, you know, or you know, eight years later. 
I mean, it's the same sort of. It doesn't seem like the same. What what, hey, what is it to guarantee that 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 deal would be frozen in 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 place forever? Yeah, can can you elaborate on that? Because I know what you're talking about, but I don't think some of your listeners got your analogy. Yeah, the, I'm making the analogy to the. And by the way, thank you for pointing that out because I'm I'm usually trying to explain what my guests are saying, so I should explain myself. Yeah, I'm talking about the case of the uh, the income tax. It was it was said initially that we'll have an income tax, that'll be a tax on wealth, and we will lift the tariff, because this at, at that time, the tariff was thought to be the enemy of the common man, where today the tariff is portrayed as the savior of the common man, so don't get confused. So it was thought, well, we'll get rid of this tariff that's regressive and bad for the common man, and instead of that, we'll have the income tax, and that's a, that's a trade-off we can all be happy with. But by the early 1920s, so about eight years later, they brought the tariff back too. So you had the income tax and the tariff, and this so much for the deal that we'll swap one for the other. That's not how government works in the long run. Right, and it's funny. I'm glad you brought that analogy up, Todd, and that's part of what I've been doing here is to say just how naive these arguments are. And it's really irksome to be coming out of the Niskanen Center, which is named after one of the pioneers in public choice theory, William Niskanen, right? That's one of his contributions. And so for people to be talking so naively about, oh, no, there's no danger in introducing this whole new category of taxation as long as there's a deal to use all the revenue to offset other ones. And, and buy, you know, gosh darn it, they better stick to this deal this time because, yeah, you're right. Historically, that was. And I, I even went back and looked at some of that time when I was doing a piece on this. There were people arguing, uh, you know, in, on the, the floor of the House or whatever when they were br- saying, why don't we bring in this new federal income tax? And people were worried about, well, geez, it might get out of hand. You know, the, yeah, the, the rates initially are going to be modest, but you know, what's to stop the government from jacking up these rates? That's a big deal to be directly taxing individuals. Should let's let's think before we jump in here. And some people actually said, no, don't worry, because um, the individual will directly be getting taxed by Washington. The people will have an interest in frugality. Right. And so we actually they, they expected that this would lead to lower government spending. That's what their argument was, that if you introduce a federal income tax, the federal budget will go down because now the citizens will be more, you know, hawks watching every penny being spent because they're directly individually being taxed to fund it. So they, that, whether they believe that or not at the time, that certainly isn't what happened in practice. And so that's how I feel when I see some of these arguments about, oh, don't worry. we're. Go-. I mean, just on the face of it, Tom, just to show how absurd it is, everybody agrees a tax on carbon dioxide emissions, prima facie, if nothing else is done, will directly hurt poor people the most because it will raise energy prices and poor people, obviously a larger fraction of their budget is devoted to their electric bill or their natural gas bill in the winter and so on than it is for rich people. And so to make these economically, these models work economically to show the GDP is going to grow and blah, 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 they have to assume that this new tax, which is going to slam poor people the revenues of that are then going to be used to give tax breaks to capitalists. Do you think Thomas Piketty would sign off on that? I mean, this is absurd. Now, he's saying, though, that we should, we being conservatives, I don't necessarily want to, well, conservatives and libertarians ought to support this because the fact is the federal government's going to limit carbon emissions anyway, but they're going to do it in their old clumsy 1970s command and control style, whereas his plan is more market-friendly and more efficient so given that it's coming anyway, we might as well accept his approach. Now, and then you've responded to that. Well, actually, I don't want to take away your punchline. How have you responded to that? Okay, right. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because, yeah, I did miss that element in the when I was summarizing his case. So, yeah, that is a big part of his case is to say, uh, as you say, look at the right now because – you conservatives and libertarians are being such obstinate jerks about this and, and just you know flipping the table over and storming out because you're not getting your way. The left is going ahead with regulations, right? It's not that you're maintaining a free market free of government intervention in the name of climate change. We're getting these top-down commands, things like automobile cafe standards, direct EPA regulations on coal-fired power plants, da 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 da. You you know you name it across the board. All these interventions, which are being justified in part because of the, the threat of climate change. And so if we had this so-called market solution, you know, we put in, you price carbon correctly, you let the polluters internalize the, the externalities and they, they're paying out of pocket for the damage they're causing to future generations. And so then the case for all these other interventions falls away. So that can be part of our grand deal with these people. So there, my response is to say, among other things, again, what would William Niskanen, the public choice theorists, have to say about that, that once a, a bureaucracy is formed, 
Are they just going to say, oh, you mean our original mission went away? Okay, we'll all resign now. Thanks. You know, get rid of our budget. That's not going to happen. They're going to come up with ways to stay in power. And moreover, you can look like what the EPA is doing with in terms of coal-fired power plants. It's funny. Taylor was citing studies showing that their regulations cost way more in terms of economic compliance costs than what the Obama administration says the damage from emitting a ton of CO2 is. So even on their own terms, they're hurting the U.S. more than they're helping humanity with these regulations. And so my point was, it's not that they're doing it because their hands are tied and they're doing the best they can to save humanity, you know, notwithstanding the obstinance of these conservatives who won't give them the tool they really need, that what they're doing makes no sense. It would be better to do nothing than for the EPA to be doing these particular interventions against coal-fired power plants, again, not using the Heritage Foundation's numbers, using the Obama administration's own numbers. And so clearly this is not about that they're, you know, these environmentalists are up at night worrying about, oh, gee, how do we maximize utility for people three generations from now? No, this is clearly they want more government intervention in the energy sector. They think Americans consume too much, period. And there's, you know, all and, all, and of course, all the other groups who are going to be in the gravy train getting once these trillions of dollars start flowing, who realize they're going to have access to that. So this is not about they want to just do their darndest to follow a textbook economic model and mitigate climate change damage. And geez, they really wish they could use a market solution, but now they have no choice but to go to these regular. That's not what's going on. And so why, if we gave them the carbon tax, would they all of a sudden agree, OK, yeah, we'll get rid of all these crazy regulations now. Those regulations exist for other reasons. There's a part of what you said that I think would not resonate with the average American. Well, I mean, you know, the whole show doesn't resonate. <laughs> the whole Tom Wood show. <laughs> Particularly <laughs> women. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. That, that, by the way, let me explain. This time, let me explain the guest's comment. That's a reference to the demographic survey that I did, and we got about 1,700 responses. And it turns out that the audience is 93% men. And seven percent women. So that's like that's even worse than a typical libertarian conference. But that's okay. It just makes the women feel yeah, like they're part of an elite. Ninety-three percent men and four percent boys. So keep that yeah, in mind. That's right. Indeed. Indeed. Well, I think some people would say, given the apocalyptic scenarios that are often described to us as to, you know, regarding. Uh, what the world would look like in the absence of any action on climate change, it's hard to imagine that we could think that no matter how clunky the EPA's intervention is, that it could possibly be worse than doing nothing. Yes, it may slow down the U.S. economy, but we're not all dying because of rising sea levels. Right. So there's there's two ways of dealing with that. So one is to say, look, if if the point is just to say, hey, we can't quantify this stuff. This is awful. This is a cataclysmic, you know, we really need to totally reduce global emissions very quickly or else there's a good chance billions of people are going to die. And how do you put numbers on that? Okay, that's fine. But then why do they go through the farce of having a working group that goes and establishes the so-called social cost of carbon that popped out at you know, $42 a ton or whatever the number is, depending on the, the time period and the, and the interest rate you're using and so on, right? So they go through this illusion this to make it look like they're being real scientific and quantifying stuff. Oh, this is just market principles. And you know, so you, you can't talk about establishing a carbon tax to make people internalize the externalities and blah, blah, if you don't actually have numbers involved and it's just this qualitative, we're all going to die unless we do this right away. Okay, so, that, so that's one thing, that the rhetoric doesn't match, that they're, they're trying to um, grab textbook economics and make it look like these are just principles of efficient uh, use of resources when it's just this apocalyptic thing that, hey, this is the end of the world unless we do such and such. OK, so that that's uh, one thing. The other thing, though, is on their own terms, let me just give you your re- our listeners a statistic here. So this guy, Chip Knappenberger, who is a professional climate scientist, right? He's not just some blogger or something. That's his job. He's trained. He used the IPCC's own models and he said, OK, let's plug in and assume and take the, you know, the projections of under the various scenarios of economic growth and whatever that the IPCC puts out. Oh, by the way, the IPCC is the 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 bot the UN body that meets and publishes the so-called consensus science every few years. That's what that stands for. And so he said, what if the US right now went to zero carbon dioxide emissions forever for the rest of time? And then we looked at the year 2100 and we said everybody, every other country continues along the trajectory 
you know, that's in the baseline of the IPCC projections. But instead of the U.S. rising along with its population and economy and so on, it just goes to zero right now for the rest of the century. In the year 2100, using their own models, the, the global temperature would be 0.2 degrees Celsius cooler than it otherwise would be. OK, so the, my point in going through that is just to get people to realize whatever the U.S. government does on the U.S. economy is nothing. It is a drop in the bucket compared to these things. So all this stuff, you would have to make an argument, and some people try to do it, to say, no, the point of the U.S. government you know, shackling its coal-fired power plants or putting uh, mileage standards on cars sold in the U.S. and blah, 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 the point of all that is just to – get other governments to agree like China and India to limit their emissions because they're certainly not going to do it if the U.S. won't even do it. So it's a much more complicated argument that if the situation is so catastrophic, then cutting back on U.S. emissions 30 percent or 40 percent, that's nothing. And so it just shows I don't believe these people. I don't think they believe their own rhetoric. Let me just give you one other example of that. A lot of these alarmists Every few years, they keep saying, unless we get a global agreement by such and such, we will pass a tipping point. Right. And, and we never keep, get it. Yeah, and we never and pass the tipping yeah, point. They'll it keep seems. pushing it back. You know, we've, we've and, 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 and they never say, OK, now it's too late. So forget it. They, right. they, they always say, well, now, if we really don't do it. Right. Yeah. And, I mean, it's it's the same thing with with uh, <laughs> Medicare and Medicaid and, and uh, the Social Security. If we don't fix this by by today, then. It's it's hopeless forever, but they've been saying it for 30 years, and so that would mean that either it's not a problem, or in the case of the entitlements, it is a problem, but it now is too late. We have right. passed the tipping point. Right, and, and the other thing, to, another example of what I mean by that, Tom, is the pe- if you really believe that it was dire, you know, for the fate of humanity, it's, by the way, they call it the fate of the planet, and as George Carlin points out, the planet's going to be fine. Possibly humans are, you know, he's yeah, okay. Right, right, exactly, but, yeah. <laughs> Earth's not going anywhere. <laughs> so, um, but it's this idea that uh, it, it's, it's, you would think that if you really thought our grandkids are going to be underwater, or a lot of them are going to be underwater, if we don't take drastic action, and you could see, oh man, these conservatives and liberty, all they care about is business and energy prices, well then you would be the biggest proponent of nuclear power because that is zero carbon dioxide emissions or green you know what i mean but yet it you know just the association and correlation the people who are really big on we need to cut back on coal fired power plants are pushing solar and wind power they're not pushing nuclear because they don't like nuclear either and so that's what i'm saying is i don't believe that they believe their own rhetoric i think they don't like consumption Right, I think they right. think the U.S. has too high of a standard of living, and that's not fair. Yeah, exactly. And so they exactly. want to yeah, lower. Let me, let me read just a short passage from uh, one of your – I think this is your first response to Taylor. You said, if you were running the EPA, for example, and really just wanted a way to help humanity deal with the threat of $55 per ton in climate change from carbon, from carbon dioxide emissions, it would make no sense for you to impose regulations that cost $160 per ton in economic damages. Since, that what the EP, since that's what uh, – EPA officials have in fact done, according to Taylor's own numbers, then we have no reason to suppose they'll be willing to scrap the regulations once a new carbon tax is in place. The existing and proposed regulations on the energy sector are not simply blunt instruments imposed by people who only want to mitigate climate change. And as you're pointing out here, they do in fact have another agenda. Now, going through, just thinking back to what we've said so far in this episode, uh, and things that we've left unsaid. What are what are other key points that you feel like Taylor is missing or is mistaken about? Like really central to this debate. Okay, sure. And it, um, I guess one big one is this issue of participation. That when they say, for example, oh, the social cost of carbon is whatever fifty five dollars a ton. What they mean is. They have models and so forth. Make all and, and these models. I mean, there's computer simulations going out in some cases 300 years to simulate what the global you know climate is going to be and how countries are going to grow in their populations. And they're going to say if you emit one more ton of CO2 today and add up the net damages over the next several hundred years and then discount them back to today using an interest rate. This, this is the dollar figure. I mean, so just the whole enterprise. I mean, Hayek would be rolling over in his grave at that. So the idea that this is what's now being pushed on conservatives, libertarians is just the hubris behind it is mind boggling. But anyway, let's put that aside. Let's stipulate it all. Even so, 
it doesn't follow that therefore whatever that number is that therefore the US government ought to impose a carbon tax of the same magnitude because for one thing if the US government does that industries can just relocate to other countries really what that means is if all if you had a global government or if all the governments around the world had a synchronized implementation a uniform policy then possibly you could you could make sense of that but that's not what we have right now which is you have individual governments leveling restrictions on the people in their jurisdiction. And so it, even on its own terms, it doesn't follow that that's the right thing to do. In fact, the case would be much weaker. Uh, another huge element in this is what's called the the tax interaction effect. And there, I mean, there's you could get really deep into this, but it, it's it's very counterintuitive at first that the idea is in the standard textbook to say, hey, if people are doing an activity that causes $50 in damage to everybody else, the government should come along and tax them fifty dollars, and then that that makes the incentives right for you know social optimality. But that assumes there was no taxing in the first place. What if instead you have a situation where right now someone's doing an activity that causes fifty dollars in damage to other people, but there is a very distorting tax on capital and tax on labor? It does not follow that oh you should impose a tax of fifty dollars on that activity then because it interacts with the pre-existing taxes and magnifies their distortions. And so it, it, it weakens the case for a carbon tax. So it's, it's the opposite of what people, a lot of people think, given that the, what the U.S. government's doing right now, the tax code is so crazy, surely if we can bring in a new source of revenue taxing something we should be taxing and use it to reduce these other taxes, surely that's got to help. And actually that intuition's wrong. Or, or at least it's it's possibly swamped by this other factor that – so let me just say the, the case again here. When you put a tax on carbon dioxide emissions, that raises energy prices, and by making things more expensive, it exacerbates the harms or what's called the deadweight loss of the taxes on labor and capital. Because now if you're a worker, your paycheck doesn't buy as much. So it's like implicitly your tax rate has gone up, and we know that that's bad. Uh, even just using standard models. Okay, so again, it's it's very flippant and glib where these people come along and say, I don't even care if Al Gore's making this stuff up. You conservatives, if I can get you a $100 billion cut in the corporate income tax, you're on board, right? And so what if we tax carbon dioxide emissions? We know we're pumping too much stuff up there. We might not know how much, but who cares? Let's tax bads, not goods. And I'm saying, no, that is too simplistic that – the taxes interact with each other, even on their own terms. So this isn't fringe stuff. This is standard stuff in the literature of climate change that the proponents of a carbon tax pay lip service to, but they don't really get into the numbers. And it's a, it's a huge uh, effect. And then the the last thing is just, again, this is so naive. I almost sometimes feel like it's conceding too much to get into the nitty gritty of these arguments that even if it did make sense in the terms of a blackboard demonstration to go ahead and do all this, we know they're not going to obey it. Look at what happened to the rates on the federal income tax once the U.S. went into World War I. They went up to astronomical. If the American public had known what they were going to do with the federal income tax just in a few years, they wouldn't have supported it. So the same thing here, it's absurd to think that they're going to calibrate this carbon tax based on what PhD economists tell them. No, they're going to use it as a source of new revenue. And I can't believe I have to argue that point with someone from the Niskanen Center. I have two more things I want to get to before we uh, wrap up. It's it's funny, by the way, I was just looking uh, at the list of episodes. You and I talked about climate change and liberty. That was the subject, uh, the, the name of the episode, back on episode 123. And here this is episode 389. So again, I remind people, tomwoods.com slash 389 is where, first of all, I'll link to that discussion that's not focused so much on the carbon tax issue, but on climate change and libertarianism and economics more generally, but also to the different articles that we've been talking about here, the exchange between Bob and Jerry Taylor and so on. But two other things I want to get to, and I'm going to tell you them both right now so you can pace yourself, but uh, one would be I want to talk about the revenue neutral aspect of the plan that's being pushed by Jerry Taylor, because that, I could not believe how he responded to your critique of that. I mean, that that blew me away. But the other thing would be some people are going to say, look, Bob, if your approach is to say 
you know, as an economist, I have to, you know, let, I'm going to take the science at, for for granted, which may, it may be wrong, but that's not my role as a, as an economist, and nobody would listen to me if I objected to it anyway. But I'm gonna an, I'm gonna analyze the situation. They would say to you, all right, well, the science, the mainstream science from the UN, seems to be saying potentially dire things could happen, and you're saying a carbon tax is not the way to go about it. There must be something that can be done. You're saying we don't need the state to do this. We don't need this tax. What would be that thing? So those are the two things, the revenue neutral aspect and the what do we do if not this? Okay, sure. So as far as the revenue neutral thing, so for people who aren't into DC policy wonk stuff, when people talk about changes to the tax code, a thing they often throw in there is to call it revenue neutral. And so what they mean is, this is not going to affect the absolute total number of dollars in taxes that the U.S. government takes in. It's just changing the composition or the mix or the sources of it. And so they're arguing that, hey, there's there's better ways to raise revenue and there's stupid ways to raise revenue. And let's do it a smart way. OK, so when it comes to the carbon tax, one of Taylor's big things was. Um, OK, here, here. So I'm reading now from his original study. The Niskanen Center released a fairly lengthy study from Taylor telling conservatives why, or I think it was called the conservative case for a carbon tax. So here's an excerpt from that. This is from page 21. So this is Taylor talking. Many conservatives resist carbon taxes because they believe that increases in federal revenues will increase the size of government. But virtually every proposed carbon tax put on the political table includes offsetting tax cuts to ensure revenue neutrality. Revenue neutral carbon taxes will not increase the size of the federal treasury. Okay, so what Taylor is telling his readers, hey, don't worry. Yes, these proposed carbon taxes are going to bring in trillions of dollars, you know, over a decade or two time frame, which is the way they score these things, in new revenue. If we if we they calibrate the tax of the way people are recommending, it's going to be huge new tax increase. But he's saying, don't worry, that's not going to fuel more spending because the government all the serious proposals that people are recommending say, take all that revenue and do offsetting tax cuts. So it's not a net tax increase. It's just changing what you're taxing. So that's what he's. And so I pointed out in response to his original paper, uh, Mr. Taylor, that the proposal you just put forward earlier in your paper is not revenue neutral. It at least is a six hundred ninety five billion dollar net tax hike. Right. Because he was proposing uh, he was he was forwarding a tax by uh, or a tax proposal by Adele C. Morris of the Brookings Institution. OK, and there's lots of numbers floating around. It was going to take in two point seven trillion in new revenue. And then it was going to use a lot of that to refund things, give one point six trillion in corporate tax rate reduction. Dah, dah, dah. But no matter how the numbers played out, at least six hundred and ninety five billion over a 20 year horizon would go to what's called deficit reduction. So that deficit reduction, what they mean there is that's a net tax increase. Right. So more revenue is coming in, meaning the deficit is going to be that much lower. So that is not revenue neutral. That's the government taking in more money. So I pointed out, uh, Mr. Taylor, you don't know what you're or I was actually talking to conservatives and saying, don't trust a single thing coming out of this guy's mouth. Either he doesn't know what he's talking about or he's misleading you. But the proposal he just put forth earlier in his own study is hugely not revenue neutral. And yet he's assuring you, don't worry, all the serious proposals are revenue neutral. So that was ridiculous. And then you pointed this out, and mm -hmm. in response, he said, oh, my <laughs> gosh, you know what? Okay, I admit Murphy got me on this one. This was a careless mistake on my part, and I honestly don't know how it got past everybody. I'm sorry I will amend my remarks. Is that is that how it came out? I don't really Tom, remember. you have you have no career at D.C. Yeah. <laughs> That's not what he said. Oh, no, well, you're, you're kidding okay. me. What did he actually say? Right. So I would, let's just make sure your listeners get what's going on here. So— Jerry Taylor comes out with a, I forget, it was like 30 page study, something like that. Early in the study, he pushed forward this proposal of a carbon tax. Like he said, look at something like this. How come, you know, conservatives could certainly get behind something like this from this, this expert at the Brookings Institution. This is really great. Look at all this. There's corporate tax cuts, blah, blah, blah. Later in his study, he dealt with the objection that, oh, wait a minute, but won't a huge carbon tax grow the government? And he said, no, guys, don't worry. Every serious proposal on the political table is revenue neutral. So I came along then and said, actually, the one Taylor just pushed is not revenue neutral. So I can certainly find one that's not. It's, it's a huge net tax increase of at least $695 billion. So now the ball's back in his court. How does he respond to that? He, he, he says, Murphy notes that no serious carbon tax proposal yet forwarded is completely revenue neutral, 
which Murphy claims tells us all we need to know about political intent. First of all, he's incorrect. And then he links, you know, to a revenue neutral carbon tax proposal. But even were he correct, that doesn't necessarily tell us anything about the support that might exist in Democratic ranks for a revenue neutral tax for regulation swap. OK, so I know it's hard. People are just hearing me read that. But he didn't acknowledge that he screwed up. He he mischaracterized. He said he made it sound like I was claiming there's no such thing as a revenue neutral carbon tax. And then he linked to some example, not the one he put forward. You're right. Forward. Not the one he put forward. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like I don't know what to you know, it's like him saying all all dogs are poodles. And he just, you know, showed a, a selfie of him or posing with a Labrador or something. And I said, well, no, the, the dog you just said wasn't. And they said, Murphy just said that all dogs are Labradors. What an idiot. You know, here's a poodle. I, I don't know. It's- <laughs> <laughs> all right. So now g- give us the short. I mean, given that you did cover this in episode 123 and probably a lot of listeners really remember that very, very uh, in great detail. But never the- so you don't have to go into tremendous detail. But what would be your overview of imagine that this really is happening? Imagine that this really is a threat. What would be a free market or libertarian response? OK, sure. So. Again, the standard disclaimer when we talk about stuff like this, whether it's poverty or uh, terrorists or illiteracy or people who are getting you know, the, uh, contagious disease, because there's some social problem out there, things that hurt humans, and someone comes along and says, I know, let's give a monopoly to guys in Washington with guns and nuclear bombs and so on and let them throw people in cages who get in their way, and that will probably help that problem. You're doing a service by coming along and saying, no, that will not help. That, In fact, that will probably make all these other things worse or even exacerbate the very problem you're talking about. And that's really – you're doing a service just by pointing that out. So it's not your responsibility to then solve the underlying problem. I don't have to solve world hunger to point out you know, giving money to the UN or something is, is a bad idea, giving money to warlords running these, these corrupt governments. But if I know people say, well, yeah, come on, but, but tell me more. So there's a few things. Uh, if, if what you want there, – there are plenty of – free market reforms, things that free market economists support anyway, that would lead to much lower carbon dioxide emissions. So if you're concerned about that, that's low hanging fruit. So for example, privatizing all the roads uh, and highways and so forth in the United States, that would greatly cut down on traffic congestion. And so you wouldn't have all these cars in major areas in rush hour every day, just sitting in bumper to bumper traffic, emitting carbon dioxide. Another thing is one of the biggest emitters of CO2 is the U.S. military, right? If, if you they followed Ron Paul's foreign policy recommendations, the U.S. government's emissions would go way down, right? There's things like that. Now, uh, as far as, you know, broader things, I mean, R- Murray Rothbard pointed out the conventional story when it comes to traditional air pollution and water pollution is, is exactly backwards, right? The standard leftist position is evil capitalism came along and only cares about profits and doesn't care about dumping stuff in the river. And then we needed benevolent government to come in and try to put the brakes on that. And Rothbard pointed out that no, historically, with the you know the traditions of law that you know came over from England and so on, a homeowner could go get an injunction against a, a factory dumping stuff in the river and it was coming on her under her backyard or whatever. She could go stop that. And it was governments who said, no, we want to pr- promote industrialization. And so they overturned that stuff. And so they gave they they freed major companies from the traditional legal responsibilities and framework that w- was there all along. Okay. So that, that was the government intervening in the name of promoting industrialization. And empirically, we know this is true. Look at the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was very heavily polluted in certain areas because again, the central planners thought it was more important to promote heavy industry rather than uh, to worry about the welfare and the, you know, the, the cancer rates among some of their people. Okay, so just in you know those are some some general things. Now, as far as well, gee, suppose the entire Earth were an anarcho-capitalist thing, and everyone loved Rothbard. I I have written elsewhere. Um, you know, and this gets kind of fanciful, but you know, and suppose it really were true that people realize, scientists realize, oh my gosh, if we keep emitting uh, according to these this trajectory, real bad things are going to happen. I think there is a way you could somehow bring a legal framework in there, just like. Before people knew about the radio, you know, the electromagnetic spectrum, there couldn't have been property rights in spectrum. They wouldn't, they wouldn't even made sense. But perhaps you know, once they learned that technology, maybe even in a f- purely free market with private judges giving opinions, perhaps things could have evolved. Where you know, if I'm trying to listen to the radio, my neighbor can't do something that jams it, 
you know, maybe that's somehow interfering with my property rights, right? So it's the the point is there is a framework by which you could have private sector judges rendering these opinions, and people say, well, we don't have that right now. Okay, fine. But then if you propose something in lieu of that alternative where private judges are rendering opinions on what your legal rights are in this global regime of Rothbardianism, then at least it should make sense. Okay, so again, it's they're kind of saying, if that's your first best solution, we're not going to have that, Murphy. That's impractical. We don't have Rothbardian judges where homeowners can bring a case against someone emitting CO2. And so therefore, the state has to come in you know, in, in for the lack of, of, of a better solution. And so there I'm just going to point out, well, no, what you're proposing would make things worse using your own numbers. And so that's how I'm vetoing that. Well, as I say, I'm going to link to episode 123, where we talk about this in more detail. But of course, I mean, the real clearinghouse for this episode is the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 389. Everything we've talked about back and forth, both by you and Jerry Taylor, That'll all be there, and you, plus a couple of other extra pieces, the one we mentioned at the very beginning, and then your piece from December 2014, uh, the case for a carbon tax is much weaker than you think. Uh, we'll, we'll put that all up there. So uh, thanks, Bob. I appreciate you doing this, especially we're recording this on a Saturday, which is a first in the history of the show, because you're going to be on the road, and I wanted to grab you before you left. And I am literally, I and mean, people don't need to know this, but I'm telling them, I'm actually in my pajamas. I get in the car, drove to the office. I'm, st- I'm still dr- And I, I figured, well, nobody will be around. No one's going to see me. And it turns out there are people here. <laughs> it was kind of unfortunate. but anyways. And they're all Tom Woods fans, right? So now there's pictures on Facebook. Yeah, exactly. Up. I'm afraid to look. I am afraid to look, as a matter of fact. All right. Thanks again, Bob. All right. Thanks, Tom. All right, everybody. You are missing out and not getting the full value of this episode if you don't check out TomWoods.com slash 389, where you'll find all the relevant links. You'll find out all about Bob Murphy. You'll get free books by Bob Murphy. And a reminder that you can get two of his books in audio format. You can also get my own most recent book, Real Descent, A Libertarian Sets Fire to the Index Card of Allowable Opinion, with me narrating it. You can get one of these audiobooks for free via the offer through TomWoodsAudio.com. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. Everybody, make sure and subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher so you don't miss a single episode. And we'll be doing it again tomorrow. Thanks for listening. The Tom Woods Show.